Your reasons for listening to this show, well, those are your own. But just keep in mind that the views, information, or opinions expressed on the Tuttle Daily Podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of our sponsors. Yeah, it's called free speech, people. Nobody's forcing you to listen. Get ready for your daily dose of Tuttle. Uh, the all-time greatest uh, intern slash producer we've ever had, of course, Tuttle. Tuttle in Florida. From the Hobo Fish Camp, it's the Tuttle Daily Podcast. No wonder nobody likes you, Tuttle. Everything's a goddamn debate. Greetings and welcome to another edition of the Tuttle Daily Podcast. Hopefully you guys are enjoying your day so far. A couple of ways you can get a hold of me. You can email me, Tuttle at gmail.com. That's Tuttle with two Ds, D-U-D-D-L-E at gmail.com. Or you can leave me a voicemail or even a text, 407-270-3044. Want to thank my good friend, because I, I got to get right into the content. I, I got to get my plugs and, and how you can get a hold of me, social media, all that good stuff. Check out my good friend, Ian Hanna. If you're in the market to buy or sell a home in the Flagler, Volusia, Brevard area, go check him out. He helped my mom save a lot of money on the new place that she ended up buying. The guy is a whiz at drone footage. One of the most important things you're wanting on a house is to be able to check out the roof because of all the hurricanes we've gotten. Uh, Not as of late, but it'll eventually happen. It's just the law of averages. Check out my good friend, Ian Hanna. Go to his website, ianhannahomes.com. I'm going to get into my first news story. Uh, There's a lot of buffets. You know, when, when you're middle class to lower class, Buffets, like, you you love buffets. Golden Corral, Doves, Shoney's, any of the uh, old white trash buffets. And I got the full unedited video where you can see the melee that ended up happening, but this ended up happening, I think, uh, North Carolina, no, Pennsylvania, I think. Not absolutely sure. I didn't even know they had Golden Corrals up in Pennsylvania. But there was a fight because they ran out of all-you-could-eat steak, and people just weren't having it. Well, I talked to a man who posted that video online. He says he was told that fight broke out after the buffet here ran out of steak. I, come on. Think about this, guys. Look, I, I'm not talking down about buffets because, listen, uh, some of the best meals I ever had were at buffets. It's just you you deal with it. That's the type of food that you like. I mean, if you come from a rich family and you're you're used to eating, you know, grade A, some of the best meat, cooked the best, that's what you're used to. But when, when you're middle class, blue collar, like I was growing up, my family growing up, a lot of people here in the United States are like, all right, steak is steak. And if they promise me all I could eat steak and it's not there, I'm ready to throw down. Now, looking back on it, though, like, I don't I don't think it was worth this big, like, catastrophe all over running out of steak. And this all needs to go back on the Golden Corral. Come on. Stop skimping on the steak. You need to be bringing plates of steak out every 10 to 15 minutes to make sure that we don't have a steak gate like we had here. Video shared with Eyewitness News shows punches being thrown and high chairs flying as a fight breaks out inside the Golden Corral in Ben Salem Friday evening. Once again, like I said, go to any of my social media, twitter.com slash Tuttle, facebook.com slash Tuttle, instagram.com slash Tuttle. It's all up there. You'll be able to see the unedited video. Just go there. Very easy to find. It's uh, You know what? I'll even pin it. I'll pin it at the top of all my social media platforms. But yes, the unedited video is there. And I got to tell you, high chairs, booster chairs, just uh, wooden chairs, uh, it just uh, bar stools, they were all being thrown. I, it, it was absolute mayhem. This, this was like a straight up table, ladder, and chair match that you would see in the WWE. <laughs> Ben Salem police confirm the brawl may have involved more than 40 people and happened following an argument among some customers. Officers are still looking into what caused the argument. I've never seen nothing like that in in Golden Corral before. Once again, proof that the news gets the most dumb people that they obviously can. 
I've never seen nothing like it. Well, that means that you have, because it's it's a straight up double negative all day. Never have I no I, I've never seen nothing like this. Cute, cute. This man who used to work at the Ben Salem Golden Corral says he was told by a current employee about the initial altercation. From what I heard, it was over steak. Um, apparently somebody cut in line. His friend heard the same details. There was a shortage of steak. And yeah, two parties like were involved. I know, man. Uh, this whole news story is like... Uh, uh, it sounds like the script for a South Park episode, if I'm just being honest. It, this is a straight up, I would almost guarantee you that the creators of South Park will do a Golden Corral State Gate Mayhem Royal Rumble event. Because it's all, this is all buffet steak. We're, we're not even talking about prime hip rib here. We're probably talking about skirt steak. So no fat on it at all. Tough as hell. You, I mean, good luck if you're an elderly person that has dentures. There's no way you're getting through some of that meat. But just like I said, when you're used to eating garbage steak, you will fight over garbage steak. Take a close listen, and a man can be heard saying, all I wanted was some steak. <laughs> By the way, th this did happen on a Friday. And that guy just said, all I wanted was some steak. This guy's probably been, you know, when you get to a certain age, I'm not saying you've given up on life, but you're you're just complacent. You're you're complacent. You work a job you hate. Your boss is a complete a hole. He's riding your ass. You're working a lot of hours. Maybe you're not even getting paid for because they're not paying overtime. And the only thing that keeps you going through the whole entire week. Come home, your kids are being little bastards, your wife just bitching at you, not giving you any sex because he says or she says that you're not being the husband that he thought you were going to be. And the only thing that's keeping you through, the only thing that is keeping you from going postal, the only thing that's keeping you from driving into work or coming home from work and driving on into head-on traffic, going the wrong way. You just want to end it all. The only thing that is saving you is that Golden Corral all-you-can-eat steak on Friday. And you can't even get that because they, they ran out of steak. And now everybody's throwing chairs. And you're just like, what the hell has my life become? Golden Corral wouldn't answer our email asking if a lack of steak caused the melee. But JK Hospitality, the Golden Corral franchise, wrote in a statement, thankfully no serious injuries have been reported. The safety of our guests and coworkers is our top priority. Oh my gosh. Meantime, people we showed the video to blamed the customers. Not respect for people or for property or anything. Disgusted that people would even do that in a public place when there's... Oh yeah, I mean, it, it is highly disrespectful what these people did, but... Let's be honest, the, the people that this news crew, this this uh, reporter talked to, they get mad about everything. They do. They, they'll, they'll bitch, they'll complain about every single little bitty thing. So if you give them something that they can really sink their teeth into, yeah, they're going to be like a great white. Their eyes are going to be rolling in the back of their head as they're just chomping down on this one. This is actually something to be upset about, but if I'm being... <laughs> Like I said, the, these are the type of people that complain about everything. The, red, the apples are too red. These oranges are too sweet. I can't take it. Children around. Our community should be safe for families. And police tell us they're still trying to identify the person who started that food fight, but say the person could face several charges, including simple assault. Live in Ben Salem at Petrillo, CBS 3 Eyewitness News. I think we're going to have this whole dichotomy vulture, even though you won't talk on the air. You, you, you'll you talk. You were talking like, oh, I guess I got to kick you in the ball. So, you know, just like in any uh, pack, you know, right now we're only a pack. So or like any couple, uh, you know, what? we'll go couple. I'll call it a couple between me and vulture. We're a couple. And one person in the couple 
has to show their dominance. And and until uh, I don't think we're going to be able to be a well oiled machine, emphasis on oiled, you need a little bit of lubrication for any good couple. But also at the same time, some somebody has to exert their dominance. And until we get into one of those uh, dominating fights with each other, where it's like, all right, cool. We know who is the stronger out of the two because we've been sizing each other up. You know, Vulture thinks because he's older than me, he has more experience than me. But I, I got youth on my side. When it comes to Vulture, even though he is a military man, you know, and I never, ever, once, I've never, ever thought about, well, I did. I took the ASBAD test. I, I would have went in as like a P4 or a P3 or a P4 if I would have decided to go the the military route. But I, I had that baseball scholarship to play community college baseball. And I was like, you know what? Peace out. But I could have, I could have gone in as like a P3, P4. But I, I really do think like, you know, in, in Marine combat training and stuff and, and I'll do it. And we got to, we, we would have to wear helmets. So I don't want to hear any excuses from Vulture, but we need to do those like pugil stick fighting, you know, with the like little, uh, softy thingies at the end where you kind of fight like your American gladiators and stuff, because I really don't even think it'd be that fair. Like, because I, I'm in the best shape mentally and physically that I've ever been in. And a lot of people are probably like, Oh yeah, you're biting off more than you can chew. Toddle. Why, why are you doing that? This, this guy was chain trained by our military. He's a Marine, the best of the best. And, and I'm just saying like, Age is on my side. I just turned 40. He's like 42. He's about to be 43. So, yeah, what I'm trying to say is that I've bounced back. I'm a lean, mean fighting machine. And I think that's what it's going to have to take. I'm, I'm going to have to exert my dominant over Vulture. I'm, I'm going to have to make him hold my pocket. And it's not going to be a bad thing. Like, when Vulture is holding my pockets, I'm going to treat him like the best of the best. Like I would treat any of my ladies. That's it. <laughs> I'm going a little bit too far there. I'm surprised he hasn't even stopped this recording yet. But yeah, like, for example, like once I do exert my uh, dominance and I show like I'm the leader, I think things are going to run a lot more smoothly. Because, you know, once you start holding the pockets, you don't want to mess up. You don't want to mess up on anything. And, and Vulture doesn't mess up on anything. So that's that's why I think he would be a good pocket holder. Oh, he's so going to kill me. Anyways, uh, waiting for my interview. Waiting for my interview with CJ. And once again, last name, kind of hard to pronounce. Is it Julianus? Or Julianus, that that's what I. But he is from Chicago. C.J. Julianus, experienced director, producer, and actor for the stage, feature films, shorts, and live events, performing art, comedy, fiction, filmmaking uh, on TV and film. So I'm just waiting on C.J. Ugh. All right, see now what is it? It's one fifty nine. C.J.'s not here, so. Mm. I was just talking about my pocket holder. Talking about my pocket holder, Vulture. Oh, CJ. I think CJ might be here. CJ, how are you? Waiting for Mr. CJ. Trying to show out. Maybe think I could get a stage performance. CJ, how are you? Hi, this is Larissa. CJ will be joining us in just a second. Oh, uh, Larissa, I'm, I mean, I'll talk to you. How are you? I'm doing very well. How's Florida treating you? CJ joining. Oh, well, CJ, can I, I don't want to be rude, but like I, I'm having a conversation with uh, Larissa here. 
Yeah, uh, well, I'm part of Larissa, so deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I'm just messing with you guys. So we know. Are, Me too. Know. How are how are you guys doing today? Yeah, Florida's fine. Um, it is uh iguanas falling out of tree cold here yes. in Florida. Yeah, iguanas are falling out, out of all the trees. And and I was thinking about this, it, this easy pickings, because I've heard iguana is actually really, really good. And we have a, a lot of homeless here in, in Florida. I was like, man, wouldn't it be like <laughs> the day that you're like wanting to get out there and harvest some of your meat, jerked iguana? Could you imagine that? You put that, in, salt it, put it in the smoker. You're good to go for a couple of months. Yep, I, I, hey, I lived in Pembroke Pines for many, many years. Oh, wait, Pembroke Pines. Oh, okay. So and now Weston. I lived in Weston and Hollywood as well. And I was in the Navy down there. And I'm very familiar with that. You know, iguanas grow their tailbacks. So you could use iguanas like stone crab. Let the yes. stone crab live and grow back the claw. Let the iguana live, grow back the tail. And CJ, 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 see, me and you have hooked it off, like hooked up here. Like we made a connection here because. Like I, I went out fishing yesterday and I did I did a YouTube video and we were using crabs as bait. People were getting upset because I was pulling the claws off and I was like, look, I I'm not for sure that they don't feel it, but their their claws grow back. It's like an exoskeleton. You you don't have really any feeling there. And people got upset about that. You you gotta be very, very careful about who you offend. And you guys do a lot of stage stuff, like are you guys ever keep in mind like, oh man, I don't with cancel culture right now. We don't want to offend anybody. It, 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 is that like hindered you guys a little bit? Well, fortunately, we're not no. doing stage at the moment. No. Um, <laughs> well, any of the any of the creative stuff that you're doing though. Well, you know, we can talk about that when the are, are we already started? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're recording. Right. Yeah. Um, no, I I didn't so, waste all that good content for uh, not to be recorded. Well, you know, I have to be honest with you. Um there my philosophy as an artist and Larissa's as well is that to get people thinking you got to kind of take them out of the box and uh you know it, when we were doing theater i never ever was going to do kiss me kate or the odd couple because it's been done by everybody ad nauseum who cares and i wanted to come across new material that would compel people to talk and think and have a conversation and have opposing views. I mean, that's what art's all about, right? Yeah. We want to create art that's open-ended enough to where people can come to their own conclusions and we're not force-feeding people what they should think, but instead give people information that allows them to think for themselves and to come to their own conclusion. So that is what good art is. And now as a fisherman, I just want to tell you, Gulp makes imitation crabs that are impregnated with scent that work really, really well. Uh, man, TJ, I, you, I, I gotta tell you, man, like you would think all these people that are in film and, and stage and all that, they're all Hollywooded, but like, you're, you're talking my language. You're, you're definitely talking Florida language to me before we get into the interview, uh, TJ and, uh, Larissa, correct? Larissa, correct. how are you? Yes. All right. So before we get into the rest of the interview, uh, Tell my audience a little bit about yourselves and your backgrounds and, and what you're currently working on right now. Website, where can they find out any of the content you guys are working on? All right. Well, do, do you have a name for your listeners? Are they the, the Tuttleites? Uh, I the just, I, I, I call them supporters. You know, um, you know, a lot of people like to call them, you know, people that down, downloaders or, or listeners and stuff. And, you know, I'm I'm a big uh, football fan, uh, English football, but for my American, I you know soccer. Yeah. Uh, you know they they call their their fans supporters because they're just as important to what I do. Without them, that it you know word of mouth and talking about it on social media and stuff. That that's why I've always preferred to call the people that consume my content supporters because oh, without them. Yeah, that's that is that is a great thing to call them. And I like the comparison. I hope that they are as passionate about yeah. supporting you as uh, the uh, the footballers yeah. in Britain are for their Manchester United. <laughs> oh, see. Oh, see. You just I'm a bit I'm a big Manchester United. And I was just talking about this crazy ass story about Mason Greenwood coming out, man. Like, um, 
you know, I, I could get into it, but briefly, uh, a quick cliff notes. Uh, he got caught on audio um, verbally abusing and they're saying physically abusing and, and now accused of rape. He's been arrested over there at, at a very young age. And, and it's just such a sad story. It's, it's really sad. I mean, part of the reason we made our movie, and before we get into it, part of the reason we made our movie is because uh, I've been married to Larissa for, uh, we've been together for 17 years. We've been married for 16 years. And how did you meet? I, I don't mean to doing interrupt. Theater, but... Doing theater. Right but let, me, let me continue with this thought. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, right. gotcha, so gotcha. being married to Larissa, Larissa is obviously a very uh, attractive uh, woman. And she does a lot in the entertainment business. And in my time with her, I have seen the nonsense that she has to deal with on an ongoing basis. And female empowerment is important. Uh, leveling mm -hmm. the playing field between men and women and how uh, men go about their business versus the way women do and the way they're judged and the way that uh, they, they just face a different set of rules than we do, frankly. Oh, and, no. Yeah, it's uh, true. So, so, DJ, real quick, I and I'm not interrupting, but one of the things that I've noticed working in broadcasting and stuff is that the men in local TV, they get to age gracefully. And then the, the female anchors, you know, it's like, eh, you're getting a little bit older. We might want to move you to something else. We don't want you in the main spotlight. Exactly. And, and I, I've always felt like that's another caveat that a lot of people don't think about. Does, does that happen in film oh, and, and stage? And stuff? There's an expiration date on actresses. Period, and uh, it's the rare actress like um, Don Maggie Smith or uh, Judy Dench that get to age into roles, and I, we're seeing more of that. But we need a lot more. But but to, to back to my original thought is we need to, as men, we need to embrace the power that women bring into our lives because women have a different set of skills that men just don't. And when we work together and we realize that. There's a yin and a yang with men and women. And if we embrace mm -hmm. the yin to our yang, we're going to make the world a better place. So uh, I'm going to let Larissa continue with giving an introduction about her. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'm a full-time freelancer in the performing arts, um, as well as a published and internationally produced playwright, screenwriter, and a producer. Um, as a sag after actor, I've appeared on The Bull and the Beautiful, Chicago PD, and oh. I've worked on video Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Chicago PD. Okay, so... My dad just recently passed away seven months ago. I'm oh, not so saying so that sorry. like it's a good thing. I'm not saying that it's a good thing, but we love Chicago PD. Like we love the detective Hank Boyd. Uh, mm -hmm. He's such a badass. So I got to tell, did you play um, uh, a, a thug, a drug addict, uh, yeah. a, a, a hooker or what? Did you play an officer? I, I Maybe I'm stereotyping by saying that in the first place. Well, I was just in the season one playing uh, the poor Ukrainian who finds dead bodies. Uh, but, I remember uh, that episode. Oof. But okay. who I think you'll really recognize would be the leading man in our, um, our, our film, our romantic comedy, Mickey O'Sullivan. He was a recurring character, um, a cop on he Chicago plays, PD. He plays Tom Doyle on Chicago PD. Oh, he doesn't. Oh, okay. He's in See, our now... movie. So it's clear you haven't watched our movie. You need to get on the stick there, Duder. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Listen, listen, I'll admit to it, but but can can I'll I'll be open and honest with you. You know, you guys do a lot of acting. You got people have method acting, and, and I'm kind of like a method type podcaster slash radio. Like I like my interviews. Like I like to go in knowing the bare minimum. I like oh, to I... know what's going on. But I like, because I'll, I'll tell you why, uh, one of the first mistakes I made as an intern when I started in radio, I brought a guest into the studio before we were on the air and, and the host yelled at me. It was like, you can never recreate that magic of that first meeting. And I like my interviews to be like real life conversation. I know what you guys do and stuff. So, and you're probably like, oh, he's probably just saying this because he didn't uh, show <laughs> prep for this interview. Fine. But no, that's that's how I like to do my interviews. It, it might seem lame, but that's just the way that I've always done them. But I do Everyone now. I, I want to see the film. We want you to see the film. We want all your listeners to see the film. It's averaging four and a half stars out of five on Prime right now with hundreds and hundreds of positive reviews. We were just actually named 
one of the best independent films of 2021 by a, a film critic of the Kansas City Kansas City Film Critics Guild. We're Got really you. proud of it, um, and it includes. If you want to watch our movie, is great entertainment and get belly laughs out of it. You're a comedian; belly laughs are important. Uh, I always feel like I like drama, though. I love drama, well, though. That's in there too. So we 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 basically uh, transition from comedy to drama and back again multiple times in this film. And, and that's a hard balance, right? I mean, it is. yep it's 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 a fun tightrope to walk, though, especially when you can do it well. And uh, because the juxtaposition, when you have those dramatic moments, they can really touch you. But then you go back to comedy, it makes the laughs that much um, stronger because of the juxtaposition between the seriousness that just came before. And I think it's a better representation of how life is because life isn't all melodrama all the time. It's not. And, and it isn't all light, funny goofiness all the time. It's <laughs> both. And how better to connect with people than to, in a larger than life way, portray the emotions they feel going through a relationship or a period of their lives. Yeah. Now, I, I think you bring up a great point because, you know, like with a lot of the social issues and, you know, people being like, you know, stuffed away and not having a lot of interactions. I know that I'm guilty of this when when it be, you know, drama sometimes correlates with uh, uncomfortable situations. OK. Mm -hmm. and, and I know like when I'm in uncomfortable situations, I like to make the uncomfortable jokes or you know, just to try to lighten things up. And, and I think that am I right or wrong by yeah. saying, I, I think that's how a lot of people feel. Sometimes they, they don't like uncomfortable situations. And yeah. It's also a specific skill. Uh, I have that ability like you to see a situation for what it, I, I, when I was in the military, I always was, a, I, I had generally had a platoon that I led. And uh, so I'm really, Able to recognize and that was the Navy, right? So you were leading a Navy. bunch of seamen, yeah. right? Yep. Got I you. was a petty officer in the Navy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, but I'm able to recognize, you know, certain situations, whether they be passive aggressive or completely aggressive, and try to address them with either snark or humor. And that hopefully diffuses the situation. But other people don't have those skills. Other people, you know, you'll think of what you should have said an hour later or in the middle of the night when you wake up. Oh, I should have said that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A lot of people are like that, and it's a skill that gets developed over the long term. And I'm lucky enough to where I've got that. Larissa is not quite as good at that. I think I it's am. also formative years and how you deal with conflict in the family. What's the age difference between you guys? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I look, I mean, OK, how about this? They, they always say you're not supposed to ask a woman their age and I'm going to be respectful. I, I still say. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. And, and all that good stuff. But uh, come on, you're a dude. I should be able to ask how old you are. Well, you know, the old man's got game. We're 25 years different. We've been married for years together. Okay. Either you are you are very like romantic. You're very in touch with your feelings. Yes. Good looking guy or yes. just a massive penis. Maybe. That's, <laughs> uh, We're not no, I'm sorry. That. <laughs> all right, so, so, but, um, all right, so you guys have all done stage, though, and, and you guys have done this movie. You know, I, I've interviewed a, a lot of actors and stuff, and, you know, it, a lot of people don't realize the big difference between stage actors and movie actors, okay? Uh, can you guys, like, all right, so what, what is the average scene for a stage stage performance and the average amount of time for a scene when it comes to shooting a movie when when you're editing and stuff if you guys had to guess well they are they are quite different absolutely so uh, i actually met larissa in uh, 2005 and uh, i was producing joseph in the, in the amazing technicolor dreamcoat and the play immediately following that i did was uh les liaisons dangerous or in common terms dangerous liaisons that was a very in-depth script. I believe it was 130 pages long. And all of the actors had to memorize 130 pages of dialogue, the main actors, by verbatim for memory and perform that play for two and a half hours when we did it. So literally giant monologues that had to be completely memorized and performed convincingly on stage on an ongoing basis. 
With film as a director, I do on, on occasion like to film scenes that are continuous, that require... I love continuous shots. You know, a lot of people think that continuous shots are a gimmick. Like, I think that's because of 1917. You know, when 1917 came out, everybody, you know, oh, it's a gimmick. And yeah, you know, it's not one continuous shot the whole movie, but it's pretty damn good. But there's something about a continuous shot, in my opinion. I, I just love it. There is, there is. So there, are, there were scenes in my movie where I wanted continuous shots, but there's a huge difference between stage acting and film acting because they're two different mediums. Stage acting is a tell me medium. Film acting is a show me medium. Therefore, it's visual. And if you oftentimes have a continuous shot, it can become monotonous to the eye and the viewer. So you really have to be judicious in the way you decide to have a continuous shot if it makes sense for the script and for the overall presentation of the movie. So a lot of times it's chosen for dramatic purpose, as I'm sure you've seen. Um, like, for example, did you see Glenn Close in The Wife? Yeah, yeah, yes, I have. Um, I loved her performance in that. And especially at the climax when uh, someone else is giving a speech, but the entire shot is just her face and slowly moving in on her face. And the, like just the range of emotions she we subtly see and the understanding she comes to, very very effective in a way that could never translate on stage. Exactly, stage acting is completely different insofar as depending on the stage. So uh, mm. a lot of my plays that I did were in black box format, where it was a small stage and the audience was close to the actors, where they could act more theatrically and cinematically at the same time. But when you're doing a play in a big auditorium, let's say you, you go to a big palace to see a big, let's say you go to see- uh, People can't see your facial expressions. You as can't, much. so you have to act with your body. Is that the booming voice? You gotta be able to project, you, you gotta to be able to- project, and You have to be able to act with your body because you're, you're not gonna be able to see facial expressions. When you're watching a movie, you act with your eyes. Because I, 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 I got, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. And, and then I, I want to jump in because the same, I, I was taught the same thing in radio. Right, exactly. So you have to act with your voice because it's a non-visual medium. So with, with film, oftentimes you'll see a shot where it's a close-up on somebody's face and you don't want their mouth twitching or their nose twitching. It's all eyes. You have to not and blink. That's a skill. Yeah. The other thing is the editor cannot cut on a blink. No, you, you can't, you know, um, you know, we, we had all these great like football games this weekend and sporting events. And, and I've always been like this, that, uh, you, you listen to the commentators that are doing TV, uh, sports casting, their, their emotion, their delivery is not as great as the people that are working in an audio, like, you know, like yes. medium as much because you got to. You can't get enough details. One of the first radio guys that I ever worked for, he said, you got to remember the radio, the airwaves is your canvas. You got to paint. You can't give as much detail. It's impossible for you to give too many details. Yeah. And you're, and obviously like I can just hear listening to you now. Um, usually when we do these recordings, there is um, a video, but I'm what so much I can pick up just from interacting <laughs> with you in audio or alone um, in, in, as an actor, you learn that the skills of your voice are your pitch, your, mm -hmm. your speed, Rhythm, your your speaking, how you use pauses. Volume. Um, yeah. And, and I can hear that you're very adept at going <laughs> through all of those skills because that's maybe all I can perceive of interacting with you. Oh, I'm going to cut this as a promo. I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm going to production guy and be like, yes, yeah. Because all my friends, they tell me, like, in normal everyday life, like, I'll be hanging out with my friends, and they'll be like, why do you got to talk so loud? And I'm like, I'm not. I'm just projecting my voice. Uh, but now, all right, guys. So one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about, and I want to get into, once again, the project that, your work, uh, that, that you have out and where people can find it. But you talking about stage, I'm sorry if I'm talking about stage stuff. No, so it's, not, it's, it's our background, so whatever. Um, what is one of the most uncomfortable moments that you guys can remember where somebody just completely like fumbled the, the line? This. Yeah, and, <laughs> here's one. Here's okay, one. okay but, but but also the biggest like save slash ad lib, you know, like where it got completely off the rails, but 
somehow they saved it. Okay, so so speaking of continuous shots, imagine a show that has no blackouts, or the, again, the actors never leave the stage. Yes. Yeah. So I, I will I will type in on this because there there's there's been a few there's been a few. So I had one show. It was called God of Carnage. And it was made into a movie several years ago, directed by Roman Polanski, and it was just called Carnage. Oh, that, well, I mean, <laughs> a lot of people, they got mixed reviews on Roman they Polanski. They did not but... like the movie because the movie departed from what the script was in the, the stage version. And that happened I got you. a lot. Uh, you've got bean counters trying to figure out what people want to see rather than having faith in the script that's already been a major success in, in the theater realm. So... Anyway, I was directing this play, and it's a great play, by the way. It's a very, very uh, astute commentary on uh, adult interaction. Uh, the premise of the play was uh, one kid got in a fight with another kid on a playground, little kid, eight years old, and knocked a couple of the other kids' teeth out. So the parents get together to work it out, to figure out what they're going to do. And it's just it's a comedy of mannerisms and of different personalities. So there's a, there is a scene where the one woman is so anti-confrontational that she gets sick and she vomits all over her husband. Yeah. Hilarious, unbelievable. I mean, one of the biggest laughs I've ever heard in theater. Say, is, I hope yes. somebody really threw up on somebody because if well, that's I devised, true. I devised a pillow that okay. we put in fake vomit. And uh, it worked. it worked absolutely perfectly. But... There's a there's a very distinct lead up to that moment, and during that lead up, it went this off. Is a very intricate, very intricately written <laughs> where nobody play. stops talking. Where nobody stops. There's always something going on. Well, yeah. about twenty pages in, somebody gave a, a, a wrong cue line. They oh. jumped ahead a little bit. They gave a wrong cue line, and by doing that, the other actors jumped as well five pages ahead. Uh, and they lost that. Big they were seat. freaking out. We we've all done that. Like you're in school, and like you <laughs> you uh you kind of daze out. Maybe you're looking out out the window or something, and then you're like, oh my god, where well where where we at? Yeah. And then you're, well, you're, you're 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 panicking. So it gets better. So they jump the scene, and there was I, as a director on stage. I always say, look, if there's if somebody loses a line, you've got three seconds: one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand. Yes. Or somebody needs to jump in and do something, right? This went 30 seconds before uh, they figured out where they needed to go. It was a hole so big that you could have driven a bus through it. I, or I, 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 can, can, I, can I ask one quick thing? Do guys sure. like do any improv practice when All it comes to stage stuff just in case something happens like that? Well, when you're, when you're doing theater, you have to know everybody else's lines as well as your own you have to know your cue lines and things like that so anyway uh i was in the audience because i always i was always there to welcome guests and, and do whatever and the actors always liked having me in the audience for feedback afterwards i was in the audience i had to leave <laughs> it was just so so uncomfortable for me and the really bad thing was is i had critics in the audience that day <laughs> i was just like losing my mind and uh but luckily, the critics, they were like, you know, this is the joy of theater. Sometimes these happen. Uh, mm -hmm. The actors recovered well, and the play went off without a hitch, and I really enjoyed it. And I in actually enjoyed seeing, knowing that the actors got lost and found their way back. So All right. it worked out. So my final question is going to be for Larissa, but I, I definitely would like your input as well, CJ. But before we get into that, once again, tell my audience how they can check out your project, uh, website, trailer, whatever it may be. At Tell my audience, uh, well, my supporters, how they can do that. We would love that. It, it, this is a romantic comedy called The Misadventures of Mistress Maneater. And it blows up all the conventions of rom -com. So if you like action, if you like mystery, you'll Any enjoy sex it. scenes? I'm sorry? Any sex scenes? Like, no. I, no you know what? I got another no, no, no. question. I, see, I this is this is how I like to do my interviews. Like, they go way long because it's just like a conversation. You guys will uh, say one thing and it'll make me think of another. But all right. So I didn't mean to step all over okay. your plug. All right. Okay. Let's talk about this again. Give the title again. And we'll go from there in three, two, one, go. The Misadventures of Mistress Maneater. 
romantic comedy. It's PG-13. You can find it on um, Prime. You can find it on Tubi. So it'll be free if you're a Prime subscriber or for Tubi. That's totally free with ads. You can also find it Google Play, Apple TV, YouTube TV, IMDb TV. It's everywhere. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. Got to pay attention. There's a lot going on coming at you fast. Like I said, mystery, action. Uh, you got the romance, drama, comedy. Um, and I, I think if you, if you like a movie that makes you think and uh, one that you're not going to tune out too out of boredom, you'll enjoy it. So All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to watch this. And uh, I mean, do you guys mind if I... Because I do YouTube like uh, exclusive stuff. So... This oh, is going to be for my podcast. Like, can yeah. I review it on YouTube? And yeah. I know that I'm going to like it from just talking to you and 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 your personalities and and the way you carry yourself. Um, and so I'm I'm really excited about doing that. And maybe I can have you on again. And and you know what? It might be actually more interesting to have you two on while I'm doing the review itself because it, it could get uncomfortable. Who knows? Like, I could say <laughs> something and. And and then I mean, uh, what movie reviewer is going to offer? Be like, look, I'm going to give you an open forum, fifty fifty. Like, I will review the film itself, and then you know, like anything that I don't understand, you guys can jump in and and kind of correct me and help me understand. Maybe I'm just too dumb and I didn't get it. Well, I don't think I, I would never go that. I far. know that I'm just I'm I'm being extreme when I say that, but. Well, I I think it would be great. I think it would be great content. The thing about our movie, and this is, this is, you know, Larissa wrote this script. And oh, I didn't. Oh, yeah. Larissa. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I, Larissa, how I'm long a, did it take you? Well, um, I'm, I have a degree in screenwriting. And like I said, I'm a published and produced playwright. Uh, CJ has produced and, or directed much of my work on stage in the past. Uh, the first draft uh, came out in 2014. So that just shows you how that was long a year I, I got divorced. Or I got divorced. I'm so um, sorry. I know. I'm sorry. Hey, once again, uncomfortable comments. I, I like to do that. So I apologize. Well, let me let me go back to my original thought before I forget. Um, okay. The script as it exists, it's it's great for comedy. I mean, if you just want to watch something and get laughs out of it, it's there. But a lot of people, they like to watch films for deeper meanings. If they're looking for literary aspects, allegory, metaphor, deeper social issues, they're all there. And that's what attracted me to this. I'm going to hand back to Larissa. Well, yeah, I Larissa. I write what I want to see more of because I'm a really picky movie viewer. I've you know loved movies my whole life, watched my movies my whole life. But I think you reach a certain age where, well, especially me being in the film industry for so long, where it just takes more to satisfy me. I don't want just bulk content. You become numb. Made. Just yeah, it, I don't want product. I want something uh, stories that are smart and funny and sexy and exciting with high stakes and a lot of heart. And that hopefully when there's a, the roller coaster has come back to earth, make you feel a little more hopeful about the world too. And that's what I write and what I try to put into my creation. Larissa, what was the movie that made you fall in love with acting and writing? Oh, I, you know, growing up, I was fortunate enough to be a kid of the 90s where we had the you know, VHS. Jennifer, and, yes, loved it. VHS and could watch things over and over and over and over again. So I grew up loving musicals as a genre, but I also grew up loving uh, Zemeckis movies like Back to the Future, yeah. uh, Contact, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and when I got older, uh, Forrest Gump. Um, I loved the you know the, the classics or what was now is considered classics that everybody knew uh, when I was growing up, like Terminator, like Tarantino, 2. Tarantino, The Reservoir, you know any of those independent films you saw come out exactly. Uh, now, one of my last questions. So I know how like competitive the radio business is and 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 stage acting and and I don't know if it is that way in movies as well, too, but you have understudies that you're supposed to fill in and stuff. And we we all saw the movie like Black Swan, you know, where or Showgirls. <laughs> you remember Showgirls with uh, the chick from Saved by the Bell. You know, like, is there any of that competitive stuff that goes on that it's kind of cutthroat in the business? Or is that is that all just Hollywooded up? Um, I don't know. It really depends on the circumstance. I mean, it is very, very, very highly competitive. But what, you reach a certain point where you realize that, and I think this is, I always say this is the sign of a mature actor, 
when you're 20 years old and you walk into a room and there's a bunch of pretty young things who look just like you, you, you know, everyone's giving each other dirty looks. But a few years later, you recognize that having fear and having um, envy doesn't help you or your craft. Mm. Like having ego in the way doesn't help you. Oh, it doesn't. Craft. And the reason that people are chosen has usually has nothing to do or li- less to do with their ability or work ethic. Has nothing to do with their worthiness of as a person and has everything to do with what that director is looking for for that look and that, that tuning for that tuning fork uh, it didn't match that that what the director or writer was looking for yes uh, something you have very little to no control over we often find that less experienced actors are the ones that fall into that trap mm-hmm. of being competitive and not liking somebody because of some petty reason more seasoned, experienced actors realize that we're all in this together and there's factors that are completely out of our control. You go in, you do your best, you leave. Mm-hmm. And you forget about it. You move on to the next thing because that's the healthiest thing for you. For example, I... there's actually two actresses in our movie uh, that are kind of were pretty well known in their own circles. Uh, they came in from LA for this, Bonnie Morgan and Molly Morgan with very long resumes that you, know, you will recognize so many of their titles. But th- they met me um, actually competing on a pseudo reality show 15 years ago, and we were pitted against each other. But I quickly recognized these people are so talented. They run circles around us, but these people are so talented. I want to be friends with them. And all right. So, they came up. all right. So I know we're running long and stuff. I, I could ha- I could sit here and talk, but you were talking about that, you know, uh, actors that aren't like, the the top of the I I'm not saying anything bad, but I don't think people realize because you know you know since Atlanta has become like the Hollywood of the East. Yep. I I have so many people that I know through connections that are making a living off of doing these. Like if you get a reoccurring role, that's even better. But like you know some of these bit roles and stuff that you get, like those do lead to other things, don't they? Occasionally they do. I mean, honestly, it's about the connections you make. You can make a living, uh, though, right? I'm sorry, say that again? I, I said you can make a, I mean, like a blue class, like average day, like salary, like a nine to five type job, just doing, getting those type of roles. So I, I've known some people, maybe, maybe I'm off basis by saying that. Some people, some people, um, but honestly, the work that comes about is really more from networking. And, and having connections with people who know who you are, what your strengths are, what you can do. And frankly, if they want to be around you, uh, we have discovered, and, and you probably know this as well, sometimes it's more important to know who you don't want to work with than who you do. Yep, and, <laughs> I'm uh, guilty of that. Right, exactly. Because if you let a cancer into your clubhouse, it can, inf- <laughs> you know, it, it can screw everything up. So we were very fortunate. We have a huge cast, 40 actors, and um, only one of them, I believe, um, you know, three of them, I think we hadn't worked with in the past, but we knew um, two of them personally before, you know, we actually began filming. So everybody we chose, it was because we trusted them not only as performers, but as people to be part of our team. Yeah, because you're going to be stuck with these people for a long time. You got to, it's very important in theater because you're doing stuff for, you know, two, three, four months at a time. With movies, it's a little different because an actor comes in and they do their thing and they're gone. So with with movies, it's more your production team because they're right. the people that you're with every day. All right. So I've been I've been making notes like of guests that I have on because I, I talk to like all types of people. I I, I don't turn down any interviews. Like I, I like to tell people this. I would rather talk to the regular people. And I'm not saying that that's not a bad thing, but like, you know. Of course, I would like to have a listers on, but they're they're not going to be real with me. And and you guys have real or you're the type of guest that I love because you're honest, you're real, you talk about real life scenarios and stuff like that. And I've been making notes about people that I have on. All right, if there's any like movie entertainment news, behind the scenes stuff, I, these are the type of people I need. So I want to uh, make sure I uh, exchange contact infos uh, info with you guys. Because if there's like any, like I'll give you an example, like the um the Alec Baldwin stuff on the set of Rust, like yeah. I would love to, I would love, I I think you guys would be great people to have on that are experts that type of stuff, you know, what 
what type of, you know, safety precautions and stuff you got to go through when, when you've got, you know, guns on set or prop guns, you know, uh, because I, I really do think you guys are great. Uh, it was a great interview and stuff, and I, I really do appreciate it. Appreciate it. Before I go, uh, once again, tell uh, my supporters how they can check out your website and stuff and check out the movie. Okay, great. So again, once again, our, our movie is The Misadventures of Mrs. Maneater. It's a romantic comedy that blows up all of the genre conventions, which we're really happy about. We're on Amazon Prime, we're on Tubi, Apple TV, Google Play, uh, YouTube, we're IMDb TV. We're averaging four and a half stars out of five on Prime with hundreds and hundreds of really glowing reviews. We were actually just named one of the best independent films of 2021 by Marie Asner of the Kansas City Film Critics Circle. We're very, very proud of our movie. And we think that everybody who watches it will enjoy it for multiple reasons. If you like our movie, please leave us a rating and a review. That's how we get a better placement in the thumbnails and the carousel of these sites. And tell all your friends to watch it if you love it. And if you hate our movie, please tell all your enemies to watch it. And if you want to reach <laughs> out to us, you, our handles on Facebook and Instagram are at Mistress Maneater Movie. Yeah, basically all you need to do is Google Miss, The Misadventures of Mistress Maneater and you will have pages and pages and pages of information that you can look at. And that's the show for today. Thanks for listening to the Tuttle Daily Podcast. Hey, don't be a dickhead. Do us a favor. Like, share, and subscribe to the show. Also, check out the Tuttle category at 315live.com. The Tuttle Daily Podcast is brought to you by Starfire Transport, stitchyweb.com, and pocketbearclub.com. Special thanks to show producer Vulture and co-host Sirach. Show voiceover services brought to you by jcvoiceover.com and The Little Cheese Show. Download and subscribe to The Little Cheese Show everywhere podcasts are found. If you want to help support the show, go to paypal.me slash Tuttle on the radio. You have something you want to say? Tuttle at gmail.com or leave a voicemail at 407-270-3044. To follow all Tuttle social media, go to Tuttle.net. That's Tuttle with two Ds dot net. Thanks again for all your support, and we'll see you tomorrow on the Tuttle Daily Podcast. I get ignorant in normal situations. What? What you mean? What the fuck you mean? What, what are you talking about? Nigga, what the fuck is you talking about? Oh, shit.